Making a game is hard, but if you're smart, you can use a game engine like Unity to do some of the work for you. But I'm not smart. So in this video, I'm going to make a game in three days using just OpenGL. If you don't know what OpenGL is, don't worry about it. If Unity is like the mama of a game like Rust, then OpenGL is like Rust's grandma. And Unity's milk. I mean, mama. So I think this game should be something very original, requiring lots of hard work and dedication and making me feel quite accomplished about my Pong. We're gonna make Pong. When you see Pong, you might see a left paddle, a right paddle, and a ball. But if you look closely, they're actually just white squares. So naturally, to recreate Pong, the first thing we need to do is draw a white square to the screen. To do this, we have to get a bunch of data and send it from the CPU to the GPU. There we do some stuff to the data in this thing called the Vertex Shader, which is kind of like a mini program that runs for every vertex. After everything gets ran through the Vertex Shader, we send out a transformed position so that OpenGL can draw a shape on the screen. Then OpenGL goes through and fills in the shape like a third grader scribbling in a coloring book, and gives us a bunch of fragments to process. Oh, and if you don't know what a fragment is, it's kind of like a pixel, except not, I guess. So to process all of these fragments, we're going to need to write another mini program called the Fragment Shader, which runs for every fragment and colors it so OpenGL can do some stuff to the fragment and magically turn it into a pixel. It's in the Fragment Shader that we get individual texels from a texture. What are texels, you ask? Well, everybody knows that texels are just pixels, but more textury. So yeah, we can take a vertex and Fragment Shader from one of my other projects, and they should work fine in this game with some little minor tweaks. My shaders are really small, but people who are better at this stuff have managed to render a lot of cool stuff with just shaders. Now, I could write two different shaders to render textured and flat colored objects, but the problem with that solution is that switching between shaders in OpenGL is really slow. And actually, I think we can just render untextured stuff using a texture anyways. But Benjamin, you can't just render everything using textures. That would mean you have to make a unique texture for every white object. No, I say. Let me show you the power of a white pixel. Yes, that's right. We can make a one by one texture of a white pixel and OpenGL has no problem with this and everything will just be drawn white. So yeah, we got the vertex and fragment shaders down. Now how do we send data to the CPU to draw a square? Definitely the way we want to do this is by making an array of floats. If you don't know what a float is, it's kind of like a number, but it floats. But what will this array look like? Well, this array is technically what is called a vertex buffer. A vertex buffer is just like a real life buffet, except it's a big table of delicious signed 32-bit floating point values for our graphics card to gobble up. <laughs> And since we have a 2D square to draw, I think maybe we could have a vertex buffer with eight floats to represent the four corners, each with an X and Y value. Mr. OpenGL, send him to the Kronos documentation page and have him demonetized! Wait, there's a problem. OpenGL doesn't care about 2D coordinates. Reason? Because 2D is just 3D, but with one less D. And D stands for deep. If you guys think this is deep, make sure to hit that like button and subscribe to the bell and such. I'm trying to hit 12 likes on this video guys, can we please get 12 likes? So even though our game is 2D, we still have to give OpenGL an X, Y, and Z value for each vertex. So our vertex data is finally complete. The next thing to do is make an index buffer. Although we have all the data necessary to represent a square, the GPU isn't going to like this data, because the GPU doesn't draw squares, the GPU draws triangles. So our current data is only enough to draw a third of our square. One way to get around this is to do duplicate the data and give the GPU six vertices to draw. However, the epic way to do this is to give the GPU six numbers, which represent the order we want the GPU to draw vertices in. This is what an index buffer is. In this case, I've decided to render the vertices in the order 0, 1, 2, 0, 2, 3. And yeah, we finally have a square. If you're still awake, then don't worry. Things are about to get interesting. We're gonna do math to transform this big square to look like a ball and paddle from Pong. To do this, we need a 4x4 matrix. Why? I don't know. Basically, we start out with an identity matrix, which when we multiply in our vertex shader by all the vertex positions, we get the exact same result. From there, we can specify a 2D position and 2D size for whatever rectangle we want to draw. We take our matrix from earlier and first scale it by the size vector, and then translate it by the position vector. Once we apply these transformations to the matrix, we can then multiply it by our positions in our vertex shader and apply our respective rescale and translation. Except the transformations are in wrong order because we have to apply our matrix transformations in reverse order. And I don't know why it'd be like this. 
Usually we want to have a model matrix passed into the shader with the transformations I just described. But we also usually want a projection and view matrix. The projection represents a squashing of a 3D coordinate into a 2D plane. The view represents the position and zoom of our camera in 2D or 3D space. Since our game isn't 3D and doesn't have a camera, we can kind of just forget about the view and projection. This makes things simpler, but also means we have to work inside of normalized device coordinate space. Basically, our screen and scene consists of negative one, negative one at one corner, and positive, positive one at another corner. This means that if we specify a rectangle of equal width and height, it could be stretched too tall or wide depending on the aspect ratio of our window. Ooh, looks like the aspect ratio of the window is causing our objects to stretch. They look really wide. Uh, man, let's just, uh, yeah, that, that's better. Now that I've completed my ingenious solution to scaling the objects, we just have to specify some different rectangles to draw instead of our big dumb white square. I started by rendering the right paddle, then the left, and then the ball in the middle, and drawing the line in the middle used a repeating texture. The final thing to render is the score, which should be pretty easy to implement, right? I mean, it's just a couple of numbers that count upwards, how hard could that be? I found a PNG image of the Pong digits 0 through 9 on Google. Then I made a big array of floats to represent all of the digits I could want to render from this single texture. I did this by dividing all the texture coordinates by 10, or the number of digits, and then adding them up as they go from 0 to 9. So yeah, this should... why are they just white squares? Okay, maybe I'm using the wrong texture, and it turns out I'm using the white pixel texture from earlier to try to render the score. And that's just not going to work, so I fixed that, and just to verify that I'm not using the white pixel texture, I'm going to change the white pixel to a fuchsia pixel. And I do seem to be using a different texture. Also, ew! So if we're not using the white pixel texture, then we must be using the score texture, since the score is rendering white. I'm going to just draw on the texture and hope it makes some difference. Hmm, turns out I'm using the wrong texture coordinates so that the image only samples from the bottom left pixel. So I'll fix the texture coordinates and white squares again. It seems that pixels in the texture, which should be transparent, are being rendered as full white. I think I know what's causing this issue. Pixels in a PNG image have four channels or values, those being red, green, blue, and alpha. The combinations of red, green, and blue yield different colors, but the final channel is used to specify the opacity of the image, or lack of see-throughness. All of the pixels in my image, except for the white pixels sketching out the digits, had an alpha value of zero, and so I thought they wouldn't be drawn by OpenGL, but the issue is that in OpenGL, alpha blending is disabled by default. So let's just enable alpha blending and... Oh, joyous day, it works! I don't want to work on the score anymore, so I'm just going to limit it to three digits. To do this, I'll make each of the score values an unsigned 8-bit number. That means they count up to a grand total of 255 until looping back around to zero. Honestly, if anyone plays this game that much, then I commend them for their dedication. In the final game, I'll make a special score sound play for the 255th score as a little treat for all of you hardcore gamers. So now we have the rendering out of the way, we can just focus on programming the gameplay. Let's just go ahead and slap a box collider 2D on this paddle and... Oh, that's right, I'm not using a game engine. But fear not, I have written a collision system myself before, so this should be a piece of cake and there definitely won't be any game-breaking issues with my collisions. And with a little bit of work, I got the ball to bounce once it crossed over the X value of the paddles. Then I went about making the ball bounce off the top and bottom walls. Then I made it so if the ball misses the paddle, it can fly off screen. And if it reaches the end of the screen, the score goes up by one and the ball is teleported back to the center of the screen. So all in all, the logic behind Pong turned out to be pretty simple. But I think this game could use a little fine-tuning to make it more... fun. I want the player to control where the ball bounces, so I wrote the code for bounce control. But there's a bug where if you hit the ball on the corner of the paddle, it speeds up more than it should. Now I would fix this, but I actually like it. So I'm going to label this bug a feature, definitely not the result of my bad code. Our Pong game is feeling kind of quiet right now, so I think it's time to start adding sound. So I added sound, and now when the ball bounces it goes and when the ball scores it goes after I added the beep boop, I discovered the source of the corner bounce bug. To prevent the player's eardrum from rupturing, we should probably stop the collision from happening multiple times. 
but since I like the speed up effect, I'm gonna play a special noise for when a ball bounces twice, speed up the ball manually, and then disable further bounces. Now I think this is really cool, but I also don't want the player to just try to hit the ball on the end all the time. And I think it's a little bit too easy for the player to sit around and hit the ball on the corner at the last moment. So to prevent this, I'm gonna track the player's velocity. If they sit around for a while and suddenly hit the ball on the corner, then I'm gonna trigger a dud ball, where I play a slow down noise and slow down the ball. This way, if you want, you can try to hit the ball fast by lining it up on the end. But if you mess it up, the ball will move really slowly towards the other player, making it easy for them to line up their bounce and send the ball flying back. All right, I'm pretty satisfied with this game, so I think I'll upload it to Itch and let's see what people have to say. My ears died. Wow, Pong. How original.